pushed before. Uh, the, the Obama avoiding eight patents and, and saying no to Nan Yonkers Red Line, that was a win. Uh, there have been instances in the past where there have been overreach, and we have managed to actually stop these resolutions on the Hill. There was a, in 2008, in March, APAC uh, pushed to have a blockade of Iran resolution introduced. And NIAC and other folks, uh, you know, Code Pink and uh, some of our other groups that we work with in, in DC, we publicized the fact that this resolution was a blockade, which is an act of war. And that's, of course, not what the sponsors were calling it. Uh, but once that got out there, and people started to say, whoa, OK, hold on a second. That seems like a bit of a, a step too far. Uh, this resolution is blocked. And this is a resolution that the sponsors said this is going to pass like a hot knife through butter. And we got, we got it stopped. And I think that what we're approaching now with the Iran situation, with this, you know, Netanyahu saying we have until spring now before we have to make a decision about bombing them or not, we're reaching a point where uh, the supporters of this policy are going to, they're, they're overreaching. Uh, there is not support for war with Iran. Uh, the folks who are really intensely focused on this, sure, they want these sanctions, they want support for Israeli military strikes, they, they want U.S. to strike. A lot of, you know, a lot of these folks who are actively doing this every day. But broadly, ordinary Americans who are just following this, uh, you, know, you know, maybe not as closely, but they have not actually thought, okay, we need to go to war with Iran. They're not there yet. They haven't been sold on that yet. And I think that we have time to make sure that they don't get sold on that and that they are convinced that there's a better path. And so I think, I really do think that the next six months are going to be critical uh, for diplomacy in Iran. I think immediately after the election, there's going to be this window in which there will be a, a reinvigorated uh, negotiation process and in which the United States hopefully will be willing to give up some of these sanctions and trade the sanctions for concessions on the Iranian side regarding transparency into the nuclear program. Uh, but I do think that these next six months are going to be critical because while I view a lot of the war threats on Netanyahu's side as bluffing, designed to uh, get us to ratchet up the sanctions, uh, I also think that there's a chance that it, in six months this won't be a bluff. And that if it's not initiated by us, the Israelis, there's a very high likelihood of some accident in the Persian Gulf from happening uh, that is going to be the, you know, Casas Belli that does convince us that we need to go into this war. And so, I, I, I guess I would just end on this note that, you know, we can stop this from happening, but there needs to be a lot more of us actively engaged in this. Um, we have the facts on our side, and we need to make sure that uh, we're using these facts for a rational debate that takes into account where we actually are uh, and where Iran actually is. Uh, and, and if we do that, we can actually, uh, you know, it's not all doom and gloom, we can actually resolve this, this situation. So I hope that we have some good questions. I know a lot more that I want to talk about on this, but uh, thank you.
All right, I'm really sorry about that. I'm not a, I'm not a technology whiz. Um, I'm going to, before I start very briefly, introduce myself, tell you a little bit about my organization and what it is that we do. Um, my name is Kristen Shremsky. I'm a, I'm a journalist. In the year 2000, I was working for a suburban Chicago newspaper, and we were doing a series on the ethnic communities in Chicago's south suburbs and the Arabs was my beat. Was, I was going to write about the Arab community and it was during this time period that I learned about Arabs, I learned about Islam, I was Catholic at the time. Eventually, for personal reasons, ended up converting, but it also brought me to the Palestine cause. And um, I continued writing on the issue for about 10 years and I was actually down in rural Illinois at that time on a daily newspaper when Operation Cast Lead happened. Um, I got reinvolved with AMP, was a volunteer organization at that time. I started doing some media work for them. In April of 2009, they opened their national office, and I quit my job and decided to try to do advocacy journalism and um, work for this organization. The American Muslims for Palestine is an American organization. We work in America for Americans. And I think the reason, it's kind of telling, the reason why we're talking about Islamophobia today is one reason why I'm having to do this disclaimer. Um, we we raise our funds for private donors. We have chapters and I don't know, we have about 16 chapters right now, I think, across the country. We're not affiliated with any mosque. We don't take any money from overseas and we don't send any money overseas and um, we don't have any programs overseas. Our work is strictly in the United States, and our sole mission is to educate the public and the media about issues related to Palestine. Um, one side of that is to put a human face on Palestinians um, so that Americans can get to see who Palestinians are as a people, and the other part is to educate people about the occupation um, as a journalist, I have no problem whatsoever with the Israeli side of the story getting in the media. I have no problem with that. What I have a problem with is the fact that the Palestinian voice isn't often represented, and we're trying to change that. So I just wanted to also uh, let you know that, that I'm, the biggest thing that we do with our money, we, we hold lectures and conferences, but we produce educational materials. And there are three on the back table. We, we always distribute them for free. And um, I brought the three that are kind of related, not kind of, they are related to this issue of Zionism and Islamophobia. Um, and we, we've come under attack by some of these organizations, the first being the Anti-Defamation League. There's a whole booklet here um, questioning, are they really simply a protector of civil rights, or do they also work to silence free speech? Um, the second booklet, is the Zion, I'm going to change this title because I think that it's way too sensational, but it's called the Zionist Islamophobe Network, The Truth Behind America Terror, America's Terror Experts. And it focuses mainly on Stephen Emerson and Daniel Pipes. And when I, when I go through my presentation, things that, are, things that I'm going to touch on that are in these booklets, I'm just going to refer to the booklets in the back so that I can get through the, the slide presentation quickly. The very last booklet, 
that we have, by the permission of Max Blumenthal, an author and, and journalist, is his article he wrote a year ago called The Great Islamophobic Crusade. This came out before the Fear Inc. report that Dr. Professor Walt talked about. And this also shows linkage between Islamophobia, the spread of Islamophobia, and people tied to uh, Israel advocacy. Um, this is in its third printing. I think we've probably given out more than 10,000 of these so far. So anyway, without further ado, I'm going to get started. I'll just do the slides. Okay. That's why I came out. Okay. Do you mind? No. Okay. No, All right. Okay, so what's Islamophobia? Let's talk about that really briefly. Islamophobia is, as you see, um, close-minded prejudice or hatred against Muslims. In Islam, an Islamophobe is someone who has a very close-minded view of Islam and promotes prejudice or hatred of Islam. It's not appropriate to call someone Islamophobic if they, even if they criticize Islam, if they ask you questions about it, if they, ask you, if they uh, are critical even of the way I dress, it doesn't make somebody Islamophobic. So Islamophobes, like in, in other types of bigotry, it has to do with much more with, with hatred or spreading misinformation for really a political agenda. So why is there Islamophobia? Why is it so prevalent today in, in the mainstream? Um, if you demonize Islam, Muslims, Muslims who believe in Islam are guilty. If you criticize, you criminalize Islam through links to terrorism, you can isolate and marginalize Muslims in American society. All of this serves to other Muslims, other, in quotation marks, meaning that we're set outside of the civil society in what's considered normal. Um, and when you demonize Muslims, and most Muslims, you know, and when you demonize the idea of Muslims and Islam and people over there, it makes it much easier to bomb Iraq and Afghanistan and drop drone bombs on Pakistan and Yemen and that type of thing. Could you me some water? Yes. Yes. Okay. Daniel Pipes, who's in my book, but these are two quotes that kind of tell you the idea behind uh, the importance of Islamophobia. Western European societies are unprepared for the massive immigration of brown skinned peoples cooking strange foods and maintaining different standards of hygiene. All immigrants bring exotic customs and attitudes, but Muslim customs are more troublesome than most. He also said in 1996 that this religion would seem to have nothing, would seem to have nothing functional to offer. And we've gone from that in 1996 to saying that now we're not even a religion, but we're actually just a political movement. Who benefits from Islamophobia? Um, and this was to answer your question, sir, and you'll see my conclusion at the end. There is no direct linkage between APAC and Islamophobia. You, I could not call APAC an Islamophobic organization, but APAC definitely benefits from the amount of Islamophobia that's in the country right now. So as you see, um, we have the military industrial complex, extreme Christian groups, in those who want Israel to maintain its occupation of Palestine. And uh, the Tea Party movement also benefits from Islamophobia. And I'm gonna skip over these really quickly, but is the point of these next two slides is to show you how Israel's uh, status or purpose, its usefulness to the United States, I guess, has changed since the Cold War. So in the Cold War, we always said it's our strategic ally. Um, it helped keep the balance of power in the Middle East, and it provided valuable intelligence, and it was able to test a lot of weaponry. After the Cold War, though, we became a unipolar world, and Israel needed to recast itself. And what we're finding increasingly is recasting itself as a go-to um, body of knowledge to fight Arab nationalism, Islamic extremism, they forward the idea that there's a common threat to the West, the clash of civilizations ideas. And so this is one reason why we're seeing this linkage between Israel, the pro-Israel groups. Oh, and I want, I want to stop for a second. I meant to do this. When I use the term Zionism, I'm meaning political Zionism. There, Zion means, and Zion, Zion means 
means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. I'm talking about political Zionism, which to my organization means the political idea of really credited to Theodore Herzl that, uh, called, that at its core has the ethnic cleansing of Palestinian people to make a, a land for a, a Jewish state. So M.J. Rosenberg, writing an article in the Huffington Post, wanted, he was answering this question, um, why? And this quote comes from the time when um, the Cordoba House wanted to be built in New York City. It was dubbed the Ground Zero Mosque. Pamela Geller, one of the biggest Islam folks in the country, coined it that way. And he was explaining that they, meaning people promoting Islamophobia, they believe that the more acceptance there is of Muslims here at home, the less reflexive hatred there will be for Muslims abroad, and that, in their view, reduces America's sympathy for Israel. Again, this was also in the midterm election time, and he said to stoking Islamophobia and national security concerns boosts the gap in the midterm elections. And finally, he said the bottom line is the ABL, the AJC, the Conference of Presidents, of uh, Jewish organizations, and the other mainstream organizations are no longer Jewish organizations, let alone civil rights organizations. They are entirely about defending any and all Israeli policies and to buttress that goal of demonizing Muslims. So this is kind of the reasoning behind why we're seeing a lot of Islamophobia in this country. It's not all of the reasons, and it's much probably more nuanced. But let's talk about one of the ways that this happens. And we're talking now about framing the narrative. And the actually Israel advocate, advocates and uh, Christian groups that support Israel are behind a lot of the framing that's been going on in this country. There are other forces, but those who are um, want to shore up Israel's occupation of Palestine are really behind it. Um, we have a lot of individuals behind this. Stephen Emerson, who's in our book. Mina Shea, I'm going to talk about her a little bit later. She is the director of the Center for Religious Freedom, which is housed in the Hudson Institute. And um, Professor Walt mentioned the report called Fear Inc., which did do a great job of mapping the relationship between so many of these people who um, fund Islamophobia. What the Fair Inc. report did not do is really tie these things to Zionism or the political Zionism. And he, the Fair Inc. report calls the Hudson Institute a conservative organization and says it is not Islamophobic. And that may be. But the Center for Religious Freedom, in my view, is promoting Islamophobia. And that's housed within the Hudson Institute. Here's a list of the many of the organizations behind Islamophobia. The ones that are in red are mentioned in my booklets back there. And then we was there a question? Okay. And then here's here are a few more Atlas Shrugs is Pamela Keller's blog. Um, she's the one who's been putting the ads out lately. I don't know if you've heard of them. It was in my first frame. Okay. So here we go to the funders, and this is mostly taken from the Fear Inc. report. Oh, not very bright of me. So here you have, you have seven major funders or foundations who contributed almost $43 million to five groups um, over a 10-year period. And then I've highlighted the names of the people associated with those groups. So you'll see over and over again these names, Frank Gaffney, Daniel Pipes, David Yarushalmi. This David Yarushalmi is the person behind the creeping Sharia laws that are coming to our state legislatures. Um, he is a lawyer. He crafted the language and then lobbied state legislators to bring the bill before the House that um, know that any law in that particular state would never incorporate elements of foreign law. And um, he did that because of this idea that 
Muslims are here and we're trying to impose Sharia, which is Islamic law, on the United States. So he's the guy behind that. We have Robert Spencer and Stephen Emerson. Okay, here is one of the harder connections we have to APAC. And this came from an article that just was published on October 3rd. The Anchorage Char Charitable Fund and William Rosenwald Family Fund. Nina Rosenwald, and Max Blumenthal just wrote about her. She was a former APAC board member, and she is a huge funder of Daniel Pipes' Middle East Forum. The Newton D. N. Rochelle F. Becker Foundation's and Charitable Trust. Newton Becker is the founder of the APAC student program and a major APAC donor. And I actually verified these things. I took them from the article and I went and verified them myself. Um, the Fairbrook Foundation, which is mentioned a lot in Max Blumenthal's book that we have on the back table, it's run by Aubrey and Joyce Chernick. Um, Aubrey Chernick is a former trustee of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, which Professor Walt mentioned, an APAC affiliated think tank where Daniel Pipes is a scholar. Mark Indick was a deputy research director for APAC and he helped found WIMAP in 1985. So, so, again, we're talking about framing the narrative. All the way back in 1994, Stephen Emerson wrote a book called Terrorist Among Us, Jihad in America. It was in, actually in this book that he actually fomented a lie about the man who's the chairman of our organization, whose name is Dr. Hatem Bazian. He wrote in that book that Dr. Bazian said at a rally, um, quoting the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that he was talking about the end, about, about fighting Jews in Israel, and how it was a really, really bad statement saying that the truth would speak up, saying Jews are behind us, come and kill them. Baz, Hatem Bazin never made that comment whatsoever, but what happened was this book came out in 1994, a reporter from the Detroit Free Press picked it up and put the quote in the newspaper, and from there it's been picked up and heralded, we still hear it. Um, the reason why I wrote the ADL book, actually, is the, or I'm sorry, the Stephen Emerson book, is because that came up again sometime last spring, where it said, you know, the chairman of American Muslims for Palestine is advocating killing Jews, which is absolutely, totally false. And this, this Hadith they attributed, they said he said, is part of the prophetic end time hadith. Hadith means saying from Muhammad, but it, there, he would never speak about it, and it's part of an ideology, or not an ideology, a part of a, the prophecies about the end times, much like what you see in the book of Revelation, in the Bible, is what I'm trying to say. So this is, though, showing you how these things, they, they linger and they pick up when they snowball. So that, that book was actually turned into a movie, which won actually awards from the investigative reporters and editors organization. And then Obsession, probably the worst movie, the one that really framed the, the um, attitude about Muslims in America, this movie Obsession. Okay, I have to really hurry. Obsession, the, the point of this obsession is in moves suggesting a new, more partisan direction for activists, the people who are behind this work from a group called Aish Hachora, which is linked, linked to the Israeli settlement industry, and a group called the Clarion Fund, which was a spin off of Aish Hachora. So their, their movie and their ideas is to get this idea in the public that. The films depicting anti-Western Islamic extremists are heading a mass movement enjoying the avid support of tens of millions of Muslims worldwide. So then you get your stealth jihad idea that we're all here to perform jihad. I'm just going to that. Um, Stephen Emerson is connected to Daniel Pipes and they used to work together. Uh, and the investigative project of terrorism is Stephen Emerson's organization as a spin-off of Daniel Pipes Middle East Forum. He was discredited in 95 when he went on national news networks saying that the Oklahoma City bombing was obviously the work of um, Arab terrorists when it turned out to be a homegrown guy. 
And he went away for a while because he, he got his contracts canceled, but he reappeared after the September 11th attacks. Most of this information you can get in the book, so I will we'll go forward. Daniel Pipe's Middle East Forum has on its website that its purpose is to combat lawful Islamism. Lawful Islamism, I don't even know what that means. I, nobody's ever really decided what the term Islamism means, but he's there to combat it in lawful. So, and also to contain Iran. Those are the two main reasons behind the Middle East Forum. Okay, I'm going to spend a few more minutes talking about Nina Shea, and then I guess I'll have to wrap it up. Nina Shea, her, her biggest platform is promoting this idea of the persecution of Christians in the Arab world and in other places. She has quite um, Islamophobic ways of going about talking about this, however. She uses her her platform to push for military intervention in many situations. Um, they were roundly criticized. It was her center that pushed the idea that 80, 80 to 85 percent of American mosques are connected to Saudi Arabia Wahhabism, which is one um, idea. Is one I don't want to call it a sect, but a certain interpretation of Islam that is practiced in Saudi Arabia. This idea, is, of course, is not true, but it was the one that was picked up by Peter King last February when he did his hearings, house hearings on the radicalization of American Muslims. She published, under her leadership, the Religious Freedom Center published um, a study called Saudi Publications on Hate Ideology in Big American Mosques. The problem is, um, so what they did, they went and looked at books in the libraries of mosques around the country. The problem is they went to 15 mosques and they looked at some of the books. And from that they extrapolated this that 85% of American mosques are infiltrated with hate ideology. Um, the study, of course, was endorsed by Daniel Pipes. In 2005, the American Enterprise Institute held a conference on that study. And during that conference, um, this is what James Wilson had to say. It would about the study and about the way um, that about these books supposedly that they that they found. He said it would be the equivalent of the US government modifying the Lord's Prayer to read, give us this day our daily bread, except for Muslims, and distributing printed copies to churches across the globe. Just recently, this article came out, did it again. This article came out on June 25th. Um, the, Nina Shea also is affiliated with the Religious Freedom Commission for Discrimination. And, I'm sorry, Religious Freedom Commission. She was sued, she and the organization were sued by a Muslim woman, Sophia Wari Ahmed, because they rescinded a job offer when they found out she was Muslim. And what happened was, um, when she complained about it, they told her, well, okay, if you take the job, that's fine. Just there are certain commissioners who don't like Muslims, so just don't come in to work on the place. Call in sick. And also, Nina Shea, this, is it here? No, I guess. Nina Shea is, was quoted as saying that just make sure well, you're like one, a good Muslim, a moderate Muslim, and you don't cover your hair. So don't come into work when the commissioners don't like you, and if you don't cover your hair, then we're going to say you're a good Muslim, which then automatically makes people like me bad Muslims because I do cover my hair. And this is the kind of person that is sitting at on this International Religious Freedom Commission and her Freedom Center. Um, more APAC connections, both Emerson and Nina Shea spoke at APAC's policy conference. Daniel Pipes conducted a radio program, he calls it an APAC evening. So the, the reason why I'm going through this quickly, and the reason why I have this here is to show you that while there aren't really direct connections, you have this network and you have these relationships that are really symbiotic going back and forth. I don't have time to talk to Christians United for Israel. That's a whole other arm of this thing, which is also very, is very well connected with APAC. They share 
um, speakers back and forth. John Hagee, who was, is the president of Christmas United for Israel, spoke at the 2007 APEC Policy Conference. APEC has since um, distanced itself from him because he's anti-Semitic and he's a Holocaust reviser. He, he, he's not a very nice man. So he, he doesn't speak at their conferences anymore, but they still share quite a bit of, in the way of speakers. Um, at, at the Christmas United for Israel recent summit, they had Morton Klein the, as a speaker of the President of the Zionist Organization of America, who sits on an APAC board, Jeff Mendelssohn, who is APAC's National Outreach Director, and um, one of their own pastors, who is a frequent speaker at APAC. We're done. Okay. I'm on my master Okay. So here's my these, here's my conclusion out of all the research I did to, to put this together. There's no smoking gun that directly and emphatically links APAC to the production and dissemination of Islamophobia, but copious circumstantial evidence abounds that APAC operates at least near the parameters of the Islamophobic network, if not from within it. And even if it's not directly involved, APEC benefits tremendously from Islamophobia as it makes its lobbying efforts for war with Iran or to garner even more congressional support for Israel possible. In the end, the adage rings true, in my opinion, you are the company you keep. This quote from Harry Seidman, the former executive director of the American Jewish Congress. He says that the trend right work is something that just emerged recently. Over the past few decades, the Jewish federations and APAC have played a significant role in shaping this reactionary move by advancing the notion that we should support any government in Israel and any policy that the government espouses. The Jewish organizations that opposed this line and took the opposite position were punished financially by the wealthy donors APAC was able to put together. So, and I am sorry I had to go through that really quickly, but in the end, I'm just showing you about the network and how these things are connected and the manufacturing of Islamophobia in this country and what the purpose is. So thank you very much. We appreciate your time. Thank you. So we'll do some Q&A and then we'll have dinner in about 20 or 25 minutes. Um, that leads me to the So again, make an affiliation and make sure you get to a question there.
particularly in its attempts to discredit uh, Obama, uh, you have Democrats on the Hill who are now saying, these guys are working against us. I don't trust these guys. And that is very damaging to APAC's brand and its mission because uh, they have worked to make the question of Israel and US relations uh, sacrosanct and bipartisan. And when this becomes perceived as a partisan organization that is uh, gunning for the president and gunning for Democrats, it uh, weakens that bipartisan consensus and it creates space for other organizations to move in there and hopefully create a more uh, a, a natural discourse about that relationship uh, where nothing is sacrosanct, where we're actually talking about the issues and having a rational discussion about what is in our best interest. There have been a couple times when actually Israel has called APAC to tell them to tone down the rhetoric. <laughs> <laughs> Seems that you know the um, APEC or Israel is um, abandoning Obama and, and really supporting Romney, um, and Romney is really gung ho to. Uh, he says he wants to increase the military budget, and it's, if they steal the vote, it doesn't seem good that you know they're supporting. It seems scary that. They're supporting Romney and abandoning Obama. Is there a question? <laughs> no, more a statement. Yeah. Well, I think that actually, if you read Israeli media, um, there was an article that came out recently, and I, I don't remember if it was in a mainstream publication or one of the subtler newspapers um, that talked about Obama and how much military aid has come to Israel because of over and above the. Um, was included in the memorandum of other standing than $30 billion over 10 years. Um, that being said, it was interesting to see Netanyahu get involved in our political system when he talked about the red line. And um, it, he, it looked at one point like he was directly trying to influence uh, favor for Romney. Yeah, I, I just, again, this is, this is really damaging to what their mission is. And I think that, uh, yeah, it's telling when you have, recently you had Barbara Boxer, Senator from California, <coughs> one of the most pro APAC uh, folks in the Senate, uh, always supporting their, what, what they're asking for, who actually came out and criticized Netanyahu uh, for criticizing Obama. And while her letter, as far as the substance, was not great, it was predictable. The fact that she actually did this was a sign of this fissure that is emerging uh, in this previously bipartisan, bipartisan consensus about what to do uh, using the US-Israel relations. And I just think that, that you know, this, is, uh, this suggests that we are, in fact, uh, uh, reaching a place where there may be uh, an opening for a real debate about these things. And I frame this as Democrat Republican because Look, in Congress, that's who we're dealing with here. But what I'm really talking about is not choosing one side or the other, but actually having some opening where we can have uh, alternative perspectives and real debates about these issues, which right now is not the case. Uh, Brown Bullion from Bedford, Mass. Uh, in regards to APAC's uh, 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 run up to the Iraq war prior to 2003. Can you cite any particular statements that officers of APAC made or the lobbyists proposed publicly to help induce the United States to invade Iraq? So that Uh, there are a lot of folks who, within APAC who, who opposed that and said, 
He brought this knife, or the folks said he brought it. Uh, we go at, you know, the, the policy at the time was dual containment. There, there was a, it wasn't as clear as just APAC was behind and was supporting that war. But when the folks in the White House uh, and the, the folks at, uh, involved with you know, the project for the American Century and some of these other folks said Iraq, you know, went forward with the push for Iraq, APAC did sign on and they did eventually uh, uh, support these, support the push in Congress. Uh, and I would just note, uh, Netanyahu testified before the House Oversight Committee in 2002, and he said, Saddam is, uh, you know, I wish I had his actual words, but Saddam is about, is, is, is racing to the bomb, and so is Iran, and we need to take them both out. And basically, I mean, if you look at the language he was saying that, it's, it's almost verbatim the exact same thing he's saying now. Uh, it was, you know, 10 years ago. Uh, 
he, he actually said, he basically said that the best way for the war of to start is to a false flag in the Gulf of Mondo type of thing. And luckily there were actually a lot of bloggers, uh, Mondo White, uh, Mondo Weiss, and uh, some others that picked up on that. And really, you know, he, I don't think he knew, knew that the cameras were necessarily rolling and that he was going to record it on that, but that was an interesting comment and I hope that it's not, uh, it's not something he's basing on something he has been hearing from other folks. Yeah, my question is, uh, some people within the left have argued that uh, APAC is just only as powerful as uh, the Cuban American uh, Foundation, that supposedly APAC doesn't have as much power as uh, people think. Uh, that's one little question. On the other one, on the other hand, uh, I went to a conference uh, a, couple, a few months ago where Dr. Uh, Andrew Vasevich was speaking and he said that he didn't think that war was going to be with uh, Iran because uh, supposedly uh, Israel doesn't have the complete military capabilities to uh, you know, wave a full war and uh, supposedly the targets that they were contemplating were not uh, easy to target and the U.S. would be forced to come in to help them and they certainly seems like the U.S. didn't want that to happen. What do you have to say? Uh, you know, it, it's, it's been a matter of delay anymore. There hasn't actually been, uh, you know, it, it's almost like we're, we're, we've been working against the worst from happening and trying to put the brakes on, but nobody has actually grabbed the, the steering wheel and steered this in a different trajectory. And we can only prevent this from happening for so long before it, it, it's too late and we end up uh, dragged into a war that nobody wants, uh, but th th there's no other options that, uh, that we can Take. And I also would just say that, look, we are already in a little bit more with Iran. We're already engaged in, a, a, you know, somebody is, is assassinating scientists inside of Iran. U.S. officials have said that it is a, uh, it is a terrorist group, that it's no longer a terrorist group, it is taking off the terror list. Um, we're already you know, we're attacking Iran's computer systems. Uh, and, you know, it's going back and forth. So I would, already, I, I would just say that there are certain sort of grades of war, and we are already in a low grade. This question of military strikes is sort of the next step, and then full blown occupation is, is, uh, is, is potentially on the horizon. And I just hope that we can steer this in a different direction and end the war entirely. Well, I think it's really interesting um, in Israeli media that they have a columnist raising the question about um, how much uh, Israel is involved in the assassination of the nuclear scientists. And I think it's also really important to note that Israel has, Israel has a nuclear program. Um, and the man who outed it several years ago, his last name was arrested and in jail for many, many years. And now he's under complete house arrest and is not allowed to uh, speak to anyone. Um, it's the Demona nuclear reactor. And Israel refuses to sign the, uh, the nuclear non-proliferation treaty, correct? That's right. Yeah. So, and um, up until a few years ago, it was a completely secret program. My name is Richard Kite, and uh, I have a question regarding uh, the American Legislative Exchange Council, uh, or ALEC as it's known, um, which seems to me to be a little bit to the right of center and uh, proposes a great deal of legislation uh, in this country. And I, I wonder if you see any connection at all between the work of APAC and ALEC, and if you could amplify on that if you see a connection. I don't know of one. I'm curious. I don't know of one at this point, but I do want to have to look into it. You know, like now. Okay. Okay. I'm not aware of anything there. You know, it's more interesting how weak and how it's become just by the public exposure and their efforts. Uh, it's significant and a sign of how you know, sunlight is the best antiseptic. Mm -hmm. But I don't know of any okay. that <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Um, a question for Jamal. I, uh, back to Barbara Boxer and our uh, legislature. I read her letter um, as kind of a covering um, her behind so that 
um, because everything is now so obvious, uh, sort of a covering her behind so she could not be accused of being what she obviously is, an Israel, a, an Israel, a firster. Is there, do you feel that there's anything in our wonderful legislature of people beginning to um, worry about that? I, you know, I don't, I don't feel like should do it. Do you guys want to hear it here right now? You want to hear it here? So, uh, you know, this, this boxer letter that was sent to that novel when he criticized, uh, what happened was, uh, Obama, <coughs> or, uh, no, Hillary Clinton came out and said, we're not setting any red lines at the height of Netanyahu's campaign to get the U.S. to set a red line just a few weeks ago. And Clinton said, we're not doing that. Uh, so Obama, uh, so Netanyahu went to the U.S. press and said, no country that refuses to put a uh, red line in front of Iran has the moral authority to tell, uh, to put a red light in front of Israel. Uh, and, and basically said that, you know, implied that the United States was not supporting Israel under Obama, was not, was not supporting that relationship. Uh, and so Senator Boxer actually wrote this letter uh, to Netanyahu to criticize him, but basically what it said was, uh-uh, we're really supporting you. You know, how dare you? We are sending so much money to you. Uh, and so the question is, you know, is there a, a, a is this a growing, was that a, a sort of a way for Boxer to cover up for what could be perceived as, you know, being a, you know, quote unquote, Israel first or, or you know, a senator who's putting Israel's uh, interests above U.S. interests? You know, I, I don't see that. I don't see that as being a phenomenon that is uh, building. I think that this was purely uh, election based partisan politics, and it was a situation in which you had the Israeli Prime Minister overstepping and interfering in uh, the U.S. Uh, elections and U.S. media markets, and it was just a partisan thing. But that's that's how the game works on Capitol Hill. I mean, we need to use partisan politics to our advantage. Um, and I, so, so yeah, so I, I don't necessarily see that as something that's going to be building, but I do see Netanyahu's overstepping as being something that can be taken advantage of. To, to make people question some of these actions that he is calling for and that APAC is calling for. I would just note, that I just want to make sure to plug this effort that was, was mentioned earlier, but we have a website called ronfact.org that we just launched, and in the Boxer letter, there's something that she said. She said, you know, nobody is more committed to stopping Iran's nuclear weapon program than President Obama. And this is sort of the number one faux pas uh, in talking about Iran policy here. This assertion that there's an Iran nuclear weapons program doesn't exist. U.S. intelligence says they don't have a weapons program. Now that doesn't mean that we take their word that they, you know, aren't working towards a point where you know they're hedging and where they could eventually have this capability. But there's no program in the works. That's just that's just a fiction. And so what this Iran fact effort is is partially when things like that happen and somebody says something like, "Oh, we got to stop their their rapid pursuit towards a bomb." We call them out, and we organize grassroots to call out, uh, you know, uh, media outlets who repeat this sort of stuff verbatim, and so it gets drilled into everybody's heads that oh, they're going to have this weapons program, and just like in 2002, everybody's worrying about Saddam with his, uh, you know, the answer coming in a mushroom cloud. The same sort of narrative is being built right now, and we're trying to stop that by calling it out and by highlighting it. So IranFact.org is this effort that we have to spotlight those types of things. When, Boxer says we can write program and put the facts out there and organize the grassroots to, uh, to hold media and public things in common. Um, I've got three things that I've just stumbled across that the various friends have told me in emails and brought that I'd like you to comment on. One, is any chance, and I would hope. State your name, please. What? Oh, I'm sorry. Your name, My name is Barton Briggs. No particular affiliation. Um, Admiral Mike Mullen was in Israel a few years ago and was in, apparently in Netanyahu's space. Ray McGovern mentioned his, his trip over and but didn't quote anything exactly. Um, and I wondered if that's why Mullen is no longer chairman of the Joint Chiefs. But the other things are, 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 are other, more startling perhaps. There's a person named Alan Zabrowski, PhD in Warfare for University of Michigan, uh, 10 year Marine Corps, including Vietnam time, 
director of studies at the Army War College, which he just graduated from, and also director at time, Johns Hopkins. He was on a talk show with a, with a fellow um, editor, author, for Vegas today, and he said explicitly that he believes that Arthur Brass in Washington, most all know, his brother Gustav was behind I love number one, but even more frightening, number two, that if Arthur Brass were told to go take out Iran, they might instead whack the real nuclear problem in the Middle East, which is Israel's vast nuclear arsenal. That's not Israel, it's just the, the weapons capability. Um, can you comment on any of that? And the other thing is so there's a document now. Um, with those two points, and then afterwards we can... The other one is really critical. There's a 30 government intelligence agencies are behind a document that's classified, apparently, that Israel has a copy of, that basically says that they do not consider Israel, as it's going now, is viable. And it's being suppressed at least till after the election. Any comments on any of that? Uh, I mean, I, 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 haven't, I haven't heard, uh, I haven't heard this. Uh, I, would, I would say regarding, you know, the, the only nuclear program in the Middle East, um, I think that, that, I think that the goal should be no nuclear weapons or WMD in the Middle East and the, the entire world. Mm -hmm. And I would note that Israelis overwhelmingly, I think something like 70% of Israelis support dismantling the nuclear nuclear weapons program, uh, if that would mean all states in the region uh, would not have nuclear weapons. So I think we're about finished with questions and we'll move on to dinner. Um, and our guests will be with us for dinner. So um, I encourage you to mingle amongst yourselves and discuss. And I hope you enjoyed the program and I hope you'll join us for our uh, demonstrations. There's info about them on the back of your programs. And finally, again, I encourage you to donate um, as much as you are able to help us cover costs for this weekend. Um, uh, uh, the, so the food is not ready yet.